Shabbat Shalom, YouTube. My Hebrews and Shalomi homies. There are there is another person here who shall remain off camera. And uh, we're outside. It is the day before Sukkot 2019. And uh, we're going to read Numbers chapter 22 this morning, which is the story, beginning of the story of Balaam and Balak. And forgive me the pronunciations. We'll just get that caveat straight now. But uh, some people have Balaam, somebody, some people have Balaam and Balak and Balak and just... So we're going to go with Balaam and Balak, and the rest will have to be sorted out amongst yourselves. So, beginning in uh, Numbers 22, we saw at the end of 21, just for context, that the Israelites are now figuring out how to use their swords, and... They defeated Og of Bashan, who was a giant, and we talked about that last week. He was the last of the Rephaim, uh, a tribe of giants, and um, so the Israelites are feeling pretty good about themselves. They got two victories under their belts. They defeated Og, and then before that, who was the, uh, the Amorites, and so now um, Moab, which is where the Jeeps come from, uh, the king of Moab, uh, who's Balak, is sitting back watching going, um, this is not looking great for the Moabites. What are we going to do? And so that's the context that we find in chapter 22. We must hydrate with the holy water. Which is delicious. I added one, two ladles of... Uh, Homemade, what's that stuff? Hot chocolate on top of coffee? Oh my goodness. Fabulous. 22. And the children of Israel set out and camped in the desert plains of Moab beyond the Jordan of Jericho. So, they're near Moab. And Balak, son of Sippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And he was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was in dread because of the children of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this company is licking up all that is around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. They're cleaning up, man. They took out the Amorites, Og of Bashan. They killed like giant slayers. Um, and so, man, they're just, you know, they're... Like an ox that walks through a field eating grass, that's what the Israelites are like, right? Now Balak, son of Sippor, was sovereign, was king of the Moabites at that time. And he sent messengers to Balaam, son of Baor, at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people. So, brief stop, near the river, uh, that's what it says in Numbers, page 166, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, in the scriptures version. I don't know what it says in the King Jimmy there, but this is the Euphrates River. And the land is the land of Ammon, A-M-M-O-N. And we will see, as we work our way through numbers, the Ammonites and the fate that befalls them by the hand of Israel as well. So this is where they are near. Um, but where Bo Balaam, Bilam is from, is current day Jordan. That's the area of the world that we're talking about. So Middle East-ish, uh, which, hey, this whole book is Middle East-ish, uh, but near the land of Jordan. Okay. So he sent messengers. Balak sends messengers to Balaam, son of Baor, at Pethor, which is near the river, the Euphrates, in the land of the sons of his people, so his ancestral land, Jordan, to call to him, saying, See, a people has come from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. See, they have covered the surface of the land, and they are settling next to me. With an exclamation point. He's not stoked about this. And now, please come at once, curse this people for me, for they are strong for me. They are too strong for me. 
It might be that I strike them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. Remember that phrase. Because there's an implication there about Balaam. Okay? He whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian left with the fees for divination in their hand, the pay for Balaam. They set out for Balaam. And they came to Balaam. They spoke the words of uh, Balak to him. They said, hey, man, it's like uh, the modern, you know, or the, the equivalent of a uh, stainless steel attache case filled with $100 bills. It's like, we got this for you. We need you to make this thing happen, which is another common thing that happens in that region of the world. Hey, we need you to curse these people for us. Here's some cash. We don't know where it came from. Do this thing. And he said to them, Balaam said, Spend the night here, and I shall bring back word to you as Yahweh speaks to me. So the heads of Moab stayed with Balaam. And Elohim came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Why are these guys here? What's up? And Balaam said to Elohim. This is very interesting. Elohim came to Balaam and said, Hey, who are these guys? So Balaam says back, Balak, son of Sippor, the king of Moab, has sent me, saying, See, a people has come out of Mitzrayim to cover the surface of the land. Come now, curse them for me. It might be that I am able to fight them and drive them out. So Balaam's telling Yah, Hey, this is what the king of Moab said to me. As if Yah didn't know. But this is what he's telling Yah. And Elohim said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You do not curse the people, for they are blessed. Okay, flip to Genesis 12, 3. In the beginning of your Bible, Genesis 12, 3. If you're reading along in the scriptures, it's page 11, which we found recently. It seems like all copies of the scriptures maintain the same page count, or at least the four different copies we have in our house in three different bindings are all on the same page. So page 11 in the scriptures, uh, 12, 3. And I shall bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in you, all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. Okay. So this is Yahweh talking to Abram before Abram becomes Abraham. Go yourself out of the land from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I show you, and I shall make you a great nation and bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. This is the nation of Israel, the great nation. And I shall bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you, and in you all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. Now, this is relevant to our story here because I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, but it's worth a brief aside and I shall make you a great nation, the nation of Israel. Abraham, Abram becomes Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel. He is renamed by the Father, as we see repeatedly throughout this book. Abram becomes Abraham. Jacob becomes Israel. Paul, Saul becomes Paul, right? And so there's this rebirth. The old man dies, the new man is born, right? And this is very, I mean, that's the whole point of this book, right? Die to yourself daily and follow me. Pick up your cross and bear it, says Yeshua. And so before Abram gets renamed, remade into Abraham because of the blessing that he receives from Melchizedek, who is Yeshua, because Yeshua is the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Before Abram gets remade by Yeshua into Abraham to be the patriarch of our faith, um, the father says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, which is Israel, which is literally the offspring of Jacob, of which we're grafted into. That's the tree of life, right? But he also says, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I shall bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. That phrase right there in 12.3, and in you, all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, nations and clans there refer to groups of people. We think of nations as in having physical borders 
and lines on a map, but that's not what nations means in this word. Nations means ethnic groups of people. Kingdoms are what we would consider like countries today. And so, for I mean, the Great Commission is to go forth and spread the good news to all nations. That's all groups of people. And so we have foreshadowing here in Exodus, the very first book of Yeshua, because by Abram, the Israelites are going to be a blessing to all nations, right? Where the Great Commission is go forth and spread the good news to all nations. The Gentiles, all nations who are grafted in, we see in the book of Acts, how shall we be saved then? Abstain from fornication, from drinking blood, from uh, idols, idolatry, and from eating food that is strangled, and then therefore go on the Sabbath in all nations, for throughout the generations Moshe has had those proclaiming him on the Sabbath. Go learn the Torah, right? And so this is just, I thought it was some pretty cool foreshadowing that even in the book of Genesis, we have this being set up that the nation of Israel, which is not, and we're going to go here next just because, because bird walking is fun. The nation of Israel, the people of Israel, will be a blessing to all nations, all peoples of the earth, right here in Genesis. Um, and then because we can, keep your finger at Numbers 22 and go to Isaiah 66, um, Ishiyahu 66. And if you're in the scriptures, that's going to be page 466. Um, because we're looking at Isaiah 66, 8. And Isaiah, Isaiah 66, 8 is the prophecy that has been used to make the argument for the modern nation state of Israel, like lines on a map, Israel being the Israel of the Bible. Now, I want to just show you something. Because understanding that in context of this word, nation means groups of people. I don't believe that Israel on a map is the Israel of the Bible. And here's why. 66.8. Who has heard the like of this? Who has seen the like of these? Is a land brought forth in one, na in one day? Is a nation born at once, and see, they say right there because what was it, uh, June 7th, 1948, or whatever the day was, I don't remember, somewhere in 1948, Israel, a nation was born in a day. And they say, Look, is a land brought forth in one day? Is a nation born at once? For as soon as Sion labored, she gave birth to her children. Shall I bring to birth and not give delivery, says Yahweh? Shall I who give delivery restrain birth, said your Elohim? Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice greatly with you, with her, all you who mourn for her, so that you feed and shall be satisfied with the breast of her comforts, so that you drink deeply and shall delight yourselves in her overflowing esteem. For thus said Yahweh, See, I am extending peace to her like a river, and the esteem of nations like a flowing stream. And you shall feed, you shall be carried on the side, and be fondled on her knees. So now Jerusalem is being compared here to this woman, okay? And she's, you're going to have the comfort of her breasts and drink deeply, and you shall delight in her overflowing esteem, and peace will run from her like a river, and all nations will esteem you. Is that happening in the nation state of Israel? Not no, hell no. The nation of Israel is Yah's people, of which a worldwide awakening is happening right now of people who are coming to the fullness of understanding of this word. Israel is a nation in that a nation is a group of people. We are Israel. We are grafted into the tree of life. The nation state of Israel if we're going to lean on Isaiah 66, 8 as being the prophecy that people say spoke the nation of Israel physically on the map into existence, then surely we should look at the context of that and go, how would we know if that were true? Oh, peace flows like a river. Nope, that's not happening. Um, all the nations esteem you. Nope, that's not happening. 
So I don't see biblical truth for the nation state of Israel, the lines on the map being the Israel of the Bible. And uh, frankly, I don't see them being a blessing to all nations either. Uh, and also, it's worth noting that the nation state of Israel, when it was founded, there's not a single word in their constitution about being dedicated to Yah. Not one. It's a secular nation. And in fact, there was an argument. Ben Gurion at the time was like, we need to put this in. And a bunch of secularists were like, no, we're not doing that. And so the nation, physical nation state of Israel is not even dedicated to Yahweh Elohim. It's lines on a map. And so the idea that the father would esteem a physical nation lines on a map that does not even acknowledge him and does not bear the fruits of the very prophecy that they say born it into existence, I reject all of that. So, many teaching aside, we'll go back to numbers. Um, and so we see here Balaam, hold on coffee time. This is freaking awesome coffee. I'm going to have to do this from now on. It's got sugar in it. It's going to make me fat. It goes right to my thighs. And Elohim said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You do not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose in the morning and said to the heads of Balak, Go back to the land, for Yahweh has refused to allow me to go with you. And the heads of Moab arose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Thus Balak, who's the king of Moab, again sent heads. He sends more guys, more numerous and more esteemed than they. So he sent more guys, more important guys. He went from sending, you know, lieutenants to now he's sending, you know, uh, majors or whatever. <laughs> right? And, um, and they came to Balaam. This is uh, verse 16. And said to him, this is what Balak, son of Sippor, said, do not be withheld from coming to me, please. For I esteem you very greatly, greatly. And whatever you say to me, I do. Therefore, please come, curse this people for me. He's like, bro, I think really highly of you. Whatever you need, I got you. Just come here. I need you to curse these people. And Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house filled with silver and gold, I am unable to go beyond the word of Yahweh my Elohim to do less or more. So he's like, man, I'd love to, but I can do no more and do no less than the word of Yah. That's a fine answer. Now, Balaam is despised by the Israelites and within the man-made traditions of Judaism despised although he is referred to as a prophet which will as we work our way through this we'll see why and we'll also see why he's despised but it's interesting to note and this guy's from Jordan he's not an Israelite he exists outside of the Israelites but he believes in Yah and finds himself under the authority of Yah. Interesting, right? Uh, and in fact, you know, not spoiler alert, but this guy, um, I'm getting a text from my pastor. Sorry. It comes on the side of the screen, so I got to go like this to read it. Um, but this guy, spoiler alert, Dies by the sword of Israelites <laughs> later on. Hold on, I gotta text my pastor back. Hold on, internet. And we're back. All right. So, uh, so he's like, look, man, Balaam says, all the gold and silver in the world, I can't go past the word of Yah, which is the appropriate response to have, right? However, he says, and now, please, you may also stay here tonight and let me find out what more Yahweh says to me. He said, but y'all hang out here tonight and we'll see if Yah has something else to say to me. Right? Because he already told him, don't go with them. Don't curse these people. They're mine. They're blessed. And so Balaam's like, y'all spend the night. I'll talk to Yah again. We'll see what happens. Okay. 
And Elohim came to Balaam that night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that you do. And Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the heads of Moab. But the displeasure of Elohim burned because he went. And the messenger of Yahweh stationed himself in the way as an adversary against him. And so in the King James Version, it will say angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. Um, in the scriptures, it says the messenger of Yahweh, capital M. Uh, this is Yeshua, yet again. And, and so I've heard it said that the Old Testament or the First Testament is Yeshua concealed. And the New Testament or Second Testament is Yeshua revealed. But as we were talking about before we came out here, Yeshua is in every book of this Bible. Uh, I mean, we just saw a foreshadowing of Yeshua in Genesis, right? And then, then John tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who's the Word? It's Yeshua. Matthew five seventeen. I came not to destroy the Torah and the prophets, but to complete it, to embody it, to be it. I am it. I am the Word, is what Yeshua says. So... I think, I don't know, but I think the reason that Yah is displeased with Balaam is because it says here, if the men come to call you, rise and go with them. But it says in the morning, Balaam rose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the heads of Moab. It doesn't say that they came to call him. It seems like, to me, as an outsider looking in, that Balaam got up in the morning and made up his mind for himself. Not that these guys came looking for him, but he got up, saddled his donkey, and went on with the heads of Moab. It doesn't say they came to him, they had a conversation, and then they went on. But that's kind of anecdotal. For whatever reason that Yah chose, he was not happy that Balaam was doing this. And so, Yah sends a messenger of Yahweh, the messenger of Yahweh, to stand in his way. And as he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the messenger of Yahweh standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back on the way. Then the messenger of Yahweh stood in a narrow passage between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the messenger of Yahweh, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. And the messenger of Yahweh went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn aside right or left. And when the donkey saw the messenger of Yahweh, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's displeasure burned, and he struck the donkey with his staff. So three times, okay? Three in Hebrew numerics is the number for completion. If you have three of something, you have all of something. This guy was given three chances. How many times? Three strikes, you're out. Three magic beans. Three, you know, like, pick a fairy tale. Pick a story. Like, it's three, right? Because three to our psyche and our subconscious represents all of. Like, if you have three of something, if you got three chances, you got all the chances. So this guy had three opportunities. He had all the opportunities to not go. Yeshua was literally trying to stop this guy. Now, could he have? Absolutely. But And then that becomes a, a discussion on free will. Like, Yeshua didn't put up a force field and block him, but he gave him three opportunities to stop uh, because the pleasure of El displeasure of Elohim burned against him, and yet he continued forward. Three is also a deeply spiritual number. You know, out of the three is one, you know, so forth and so on. And when the donkey saw the messenger of Yahweh, she lay down under Balaam, so Balaam's displeasure burned, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then Yahweh opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have stricken me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have mocked me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for I would have killed you by now. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? 
was I ever known to do so to you? And he said no. And so now Balaam's having a conversation with the donkey. The donkey's like, what's up, dude? Why are you beating me? And Balaam says, if I had a sword, I'd kill you, not just beat you. And the donkey's like, am I not the same donkey you've had from jump? Of all these years we've spent together, have I ever done this to you? And Balaam's like, huh, good point. No. Let alone the fact that Balaam's having a conversation with a donkey. Which, at that point, I probably would have been like, I'm high, or something's wrong. Like, what happened? Like, I, I walked into a, a wrong dimension or something. Then Yahweh opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the messenger of Yahweh standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell on his face. Bowed his head and fell on his face. And the messenger of Yahweh said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? See, I have come out to stand against you because your way is reckless before me. Man, there's a teachable moment. So many times in my life, when I'm doing the things I shouldn't be doing, I just keep running up against roadblocks. And I just force the issue. Grit. Ugh, make it happen, right? It's like, really what I should have been doing? is acquiescing to the Father's will in my life, right? Because, and it doesn't mean when things get difficult that we quit. It means that we have the scales removed from our eyes. And then Yahweh opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the messenger of Yahweh standing in his way. It's like, so really the understanding there is to ask the Father to open our eyes to what is this opposition that I'm coming up against? Is this you standing in my way? Or is this the world? Um, because I have beat my head against the wall. I have just forced things to make them happen by my will. And of course it ended terribly, right? Because it's by the father's will. And I was in a state of apostasy at that time, but I think it's just a, a beautiful picture right here of what happens when we force the issue and go against you know, when we're working in the displeasure of Elohim, what happens? Constant roadblocks, foot crust, talking donkeys, you know, <laughs> bad, bad things, right? So, <laughs> and the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I certainly would have killed you by now and let her live. Well, my Jesus would never do that. I certainly would have killed you by now and let the donkey live. Your Jesus would do that. He's got a sword in his hand, and if you read the entirety of this book, when he comes back, there's a sword out of his mouth, which is the truth of the word by which we'll all be judged with. And those who are found lacking die. And that sucks, which is why we should all be on the journey to not be found lacking. Uh, to the best of our ability and not be wholly dependent upon the grace. Now, we, the grace is awesome. We need the grace, but we don't abuse the grace, right? Shall we sin all the more so that grace may abound? No, Yah forbid. What is sin? First John 3, 4, transgression of the law. Should we not do the things that the Father and the Son tell us to do simply because we're covered by the atoning sacrifice of the Son? No, God forbid. So... And Balaam said to the messenger of Yahweh, I have sinned. I transgressed the law, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. And now, if evil is in your eyes, let me turn back. You think if Yeshua showed up here with a sword and said, I was about to kill you, I'd be like, can I please turn back? Can I get a mulligan? A do-over, replay, anything, please. And the messenger of Yahweh said to Balaam, go with the men. But only the word that I speak to you, that you speak. And Balaam went to the heads of Balak. And when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab. So the king's coming out. He's like, sweet, this prophet guy's finally coming. This is awesome. Which is on the border of Arnon, which was in the extremity of the border. And Balak said to Balaam, did I not urgently send to you calling for you? Why didn't you get here sooner, bro? Why did you not come? Am I not able to esteem you? He's like, you don't think highly enough of me that you didn't just rush out here? You know, WTF, man. <laughs> After Balaam just got told by Yeshua that, hey, man, I would smite thee. 
And now the king's like, bro, what's the matter? You couldn't get here sooner? I probably would have punched the guy, you know? And, um, and Balaam said to Balak, see, I have come to you, exclamation point. Now, am I at all able to say somewhat the word that Elohim puts in my mouth that I speak? Whatever Yah says, that's what I'm going to speak. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kiriath Hutsoth. And Balak slaughtered cattle and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and to the heads who were with him. They made a feast. And it came to be in the morning that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of, of Baal. And from there he saw the extremity of the camp. End of 22. We're going to do 23 as well. We're not going to complete the story of Balaam and Balak this morning because we just don't have that much time. So we'll do a cliffhanger and come back to it next week. But we will read 23 as well. And Balaam said to Balak, so the prophet says to the king, build seven slaughter places for me here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. Also, it comes to mind that you can totally be considered a prophet by the people and transgress the will of the father. That's a really important point. That is a... Really important point. You can totally be considered a prophet by the people and have Yah show up, send Yeshua with a sword about ready to kill you. Okay. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered a bull and a ram on each slaughter place. Seven slaughter places, one for, you know, and a bull and a ram on each one. And then the prophet Balaam said to Balak the king, Stand by your ascending offering and let me go on. It might be that Yahweh does not come to meet me, and whatever he shows me I shall declare to you. It might be that Yahweh does come to meet me, and whatever he shows me I shall declare to you. And he went to a bare height. What does the King James say there? A high place. A high place, yep. And he went to a high place. And Elohim came to Balaam, and he said to him, I have prepared the seven slaughter places, and I have offered on each slaughter place a bull and a ram. In divine numerics, seven is the number of spiritual perfection. When Yah does a work, he does it with a seven. And in fact, great book. I read a great book called Divine Numerics and the Coming World War by Dr. Michael McGee. And I will be doing a whiteboard on it because it's that good. And I've met Dr. Michael McGee and discussed this with him in person. And he approves of me doing a whiteboard on it. But in that book, he discusses the biblical foundations for the number two being the base number for Yeshua and the number 77 being indicative of Yeshua. And interestingly enough, of the 613 commandments in the Old Testament, commands and laws... If you remove the ceremonial laws that we can no longer do because we don't have a physical temple, the temple's in here, and there's no high priest other than Yeshua, who is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek, which I believe is in the book of Hebrews, there's 277 commands left that are highly indicative of Yeshua. I was like, oh yeah, because coincidence, right? I was like, man, that's freaking awesome. And so... We're going to see here that Balaam has three slaughter places set up, and each one has seven altars. So three is the divine number, and seven is the number for spiritual completion, right? And so it's just things to be aware of. Balaam's still trying, right? And we see Yahweh's coming and talking to him. Um, and Elohim came to Balaam, and he said to him, I have prepared the seven slaughter places and have offered on each slaughter place a bull and a ram. And Yahweh put a word in the mouth of Balaam, and he said, Return to Balak, and this is what you say. And he returned to him and saw him standing by the ascending offering. So he comes down from the high place after talking with Yah, and he sees the king Balak standing there, and this is what he says to him. And he took up his proverb, and he said, Balak, the sovereign, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come cursed Jacob for me. 
and come, rage at Israel. How do I curse whom El, who God, has not cursed? And how do I rage at whom Yahweh has not raged? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I observe him. Look, a people dwelling alone, not reckon, reckoning itself among the nations. Be set apart. A people dwelling alone. My people are a peculiar people. Interesting. Who shall count the dust of Jacob and number and the number of one fourth of Israel? He's like, it's not possible. You can't even count one quarter of the people out there. Let me die the death of of the upright, and let my end be like his. And Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and look, you have kept on blessing. So Balaam is basically going through the esteem of the Israelites here. He's like, look, these people are like the dust of the earth. There's, You know, you can't even count a quarter of these people, right? Um... And how am I supposed to curse Jacob? And how do I curse whom Elohim has not cursed? Right? Which is precisely correct. And Balaam answered Balak and said, Should I not take heed to speak what Yahweh has put in my mouth? Uh, absolutely. And Balak said to him, Please come with me to another place from where you see them. He's like, maybe if we change your perspective, literally, we'll go over to this other place where you can see them. You only see the extremity, but not all of them. Curse them for me from there. And he took him to the field of Sophim, to the top of Pisgah, and built seven slaughter places and offered a bull and a ram on each slaughter place. And he said to Balak, Stand here by your ascending offering while I meet over there. And Yahweh came to Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, Go back to Balak and say this. So wash, rinse, rinse, repeat. So Balaam said to him, to Balak, went to him and saw him standing by his ascending offering and the heads of Moab with him. And Balak asked him, what did Yahweh say? And he took up his proverb and said, rise up, Balak, and hear. Listen to me, son of Sippor. El is not a man to lie. God doesn't lie, nor a son of man to repent. Has he said and would he not do or spoken and would not confirm it? See, I have received to bless, and he has blessed, and I do not reverse it. He has not looked upon wickedness in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. Yahweh, his Elohim, is with him, and the shout of a sovereign, the shout of a king, is with him. El, who brought them out of Mitzrayim, is for them like the horns of a wild ox, for there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. Now it is said to Jacob and to Israel, What has El done? What has God done? Look, a people rises like a lioness and lifts itself up like a lion. It lies not down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. <laughs> so Balaam's like, Look, <laughs> God doesn't lie. Who is he, a man to repent? Has he said, and he would not do it? Like, he does. It, he does what he says he, he does, right? Would he do and not, or spoken and not confirm it? See, I have received to bless, and he has received to bless, and he has blessed, and I do not reverse it. He's like, I, Yah has blessed these people, and there's nothing I can do about it, right? And so, Balak says to Balaam, do not curse them at all, nor bless them at all. He's, now he's getting pissy he's like stop blessing these people man um and Balaam answered and said to Balak have I not spoken to you saying all that Yahweh speaks that I do man there's a fine line here all that Yahweh speaks that I do you don't have to turn there but I'm gonna Genesis 6 the end of Genesis 6 I go here often because it illustrates a point. Genesis 6. The last line in Genesis 6. And Noah did according to all the Elohim commanded him. So he did. And the first line of Genesis 7. 
And Yahweh said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And Noah did all, did according to all that Elohim commanded him, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Righteousness is doing all that Elohim commanded, right? And so here we see Balaam, and he's like, Yo, dude, all that Yahweh speaks, that I do. And Balak said to Balaam, please come, let me take you to another place. It might be right in your eyes of Elohim that you curse them from there. He's like, one more time. We'll try one more time from a different place. And Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor that overlooks the wasteland. And Balaam said to Balak, build seven slaughter places for me here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams from here. And Balak did as Balaam had said and offered a bull and a ram on each slaughter place. And that's the end of 23. And that's where we're going to end this week because we got another couple of chapters before we get to some resolution here. And um, yeah, we're just going to have to wait to party on that. But we're going to see how Yah resolves this thing between Balaam and Balak. But it really paints the line for me. We were talking about intent to the heart earlier, right? Balaam, there's a lot of things here. Balaam was not an Israelite. Yet he knew who Yah was. He comported himself Maybe that's not even the word, but he was well-versed with what Yah had to say. Yah spoke to him, used him to bless the Israelites three times. Although we'll see that there is uh, a curse that comes out of this. And ultimately, Balaam was destroyed. There's a lot of lessons in here for us. I mean... Balaam should have never been there in the first place. If he'd really been on board with what Yah wanted from him, he wouldn't, I mean, he was stopped by Yeshua three times on the way. That in of itself is pretty illustrative to me. Like, I should have shut it down. He had three opportunities to turn around and he didn't. And as a result, he just kept going and just kept going. And even though, man, he's still talking with Elohim, he finds himself in a bad place. And ultimately, it's right at the end of this story, which we'll come to next week, but it's right at the end of this story that we see that Balaam could have turned what was a bad situation into a good one if he just kept his mouth shut and not diverted from the plan that Yah had laid out for him. Because he says, all that Yahweh speaks, that I do. Right? We just read that true up to that point but we'll see at the end of the story he goes off script and he creates quite a problem for the nation of israel uh, and then ultimately for himself because you reap what you sow and so there's not a lot of huge takeaways for me in this reading because it's very narrative we're getting back into a portion of this word where we go back on the narrative, which is great because I think it's a little bit more, it can be a little bit more relatable to people that we experience things through a story, more memorable. But it just, again, for me, really proves the point. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Men fail. I will fail. I will fail you. Right? I'll fail you. I'll fail me. Right? Men, whether they're prophets or pastors or priests or rabbis, men fail. Right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. That's why we need a Messiah. And so regardless of the esteem that Balaam had, he was still a train wreck in the eyes of Yah. And so we need to remember that, A, for ourselves, that we check our ego at the door when we go about the business of doing the work of Elohim, and B, that we don't overly trust in earthly 
people, but that we put our faith in Yah and lean not on our own understanding, right? Because even though I have the best of intentions to lead you, to lead you, to lead myself, to lead my household, to, to, to be whatever it is that this thing is, even though I have the best of intentions, one little thing can trip you up. And so, it just, I'm just very mindful of that right now from this reading. It's like, men fail. And not necessarily because they set out to do evil. But, still, things can go sideways. And so, it just comes back to having that daily walk with the Father, the relationship with Him, hearing His voice when He says, do not go, you don't go. Don't go anyway, do not go. Or when He says go, go. Whatever Yah says, whatever Yah speaks, that I do. Right? To the best of our broken ability. Now, lucky for us, we have Yeshua. We have the grace. We have the covering. Not that we abuse it, but we have it. And so hopefully if Yeshua shows up in our life, it's not with a sword, right? It's with a helping hand. And so that's what I got this week. No, no major life lessons on this one other than just the encouragement to continue in the daily walk. So shalom, y'all.